Good morning. Sabah al khair. Boker tov. Adam Boker. I'm going to say two main things. One is the theory, the concept that we base our work on, and then I will tell you what we actually do. Uh, but usually before we talk theory, we need to diagnose the problem. We're talking about 20% of Israel's population who are Palestinians who did not immigrate to Israel. Israel immigrated to us in 1948. We did not choose to be Israelis. That was the default option, which was a better option than becoming refugees. Either you accept this reality and you become practical about it, or you end up being a refugee. So my grandfather's generation decided that staying home is the better option, and they were lucky enough that they were not pushed out. So some people wanted to stay home, and they couldn't stay home in 1948. So I'm not going to give you a history lesson, but just a couple of points that frame the issue so that when we talk about the engagement uh, methodologies, we'll try to make some sense for you. Initially in 1948, uh, when Israel was established, it did two things. It found itself with 156,000 Palestinians inside the Jewish state, in a state that said to itself, and to the Palestinian leftovers that stayed in what became the State of Israel, it said to us, I'm not your country. I'm not your state. I'm the state of the Jewish people. And you better understand it. You better comprehend it. And maybe everyone will be better off if you would leave. And that was the official policy of the state for the first 20 years. Comes 1966. This community didn't comprehend that it's supposed to leave. And Israel realized that it cannot force this community out by force or by coercion or by convincing or any of that kind. Israel decides to kosher stamp Arab citizenship, lifted the military martial law that was imposed on all those Arab towns and villages, and instead of viewing us as leftovers of the enemy, started viewing us as legitimate citizens of the country. That was, from my point of view, the beginning of democracy in Israel. Because I don't think that a country can say to itself, I'm a democracy while having military administration imposed on 20% of its population. So mark the state that the beginning of democracy, in my view, was in 1966, not in 1948 in Israel. This started an interesting industry. Let's call it in that name. The industry was called coexistence. How can Jews and Arabs coexist with each other? By the way, in 1963 already, Givat Haviva, the organization I work for, started the first Jewish Arab Center for Peace. The idea was, if they are here to stay, if Jews and Arabs are here to share the same country, we didn't have West Bank, Gaza, we didn't have occupation, nothing. Before that, 1963, the West Bank was occupied in, and Gaza were occupied in 1967. Already then, we realized that if Jewish and Arab citizens are there to stay, we should find a way to coexist with each other. And this industry of coexistence education started, flourished, and it was based in, in conflict resolution. We use the term contact theory. It was based on the contact theory. Basically, we come to a meeting like this, we eat from the same plates, we legitimize each other's language, culture, food, smell, the dress, uh, you name it. The culture sharing aspect. And this is supposed to lead for peace. That was the concept. And this was the case until, 90, until the year 2000. The, the whole issue of Jewish Arab relations was mostly referred to as coexistence education or coexistence activities, whether it is with kids or with adults, with women groups, elderly groups, you name it. Comes the October 2000 clashes, 13 Arab citizens are killed by the Israeli police, parallel to the beginning of the Second Intifada. 
which highlighted a big difference in two areas. One, difference in the perspectives of the Arab citizens that, uh, regarding the Palestinian issue in contrast to the perspective of the rest of the Israeli Jews. We saw the Palestinian revolt as legitimate, revolt against occupation. Most Israeli Jews saw that as, saw that as illegitimate. We took to the streets, demonstrations, and the police killed 13 Arab citizens. That was a slap in the face of the coexistence industry. No one wanted to meet the other. The Jews related to the Arab citizens that demonstrated as traitors, as an extension of the enemy, as a fifth column. And the Arab citizens said, wait a minute, what about the promise of equal democracy that is supposed to give us space to express different perspectives? express different opinions and still be legitimate citizens. So the a debate was created on this issue that challenged the culture sharing activity. So an alternative program started in emerging. It was called the Dialogue Over Narratives. Basically, it's not, we know that hummus coexistence doesn't solve the problem. We need to talk about solving the problems. And when you talk about solving the problems, you realize suddenly that truly coexistence alone does not solve it. Because coexistence, and I'll give you an image that you can understand why it is problematic. The image is the image of a horse and a rider that have fantastic coexistence. And the more the control is seamless, the more beautiful the picture is. But there is a control structure in that picture. And not only that both of them enjoy the ride, they both enjoy the ride and they both accept the role of one being the horse and one being the rider. And at the end of a beautiful ride, they go to separate realities. One goes to the barn and eats hay, and the other goes to the castle and eats their steak. That's, that was the nature of coexistence between the Jewish and Arab citizens, which assumes inequality between the Jewish and Arab citizens in Israel. Now, let's stop there for a second. Until July 10th, 2007, every time I say there is inequality between Jews and Arabs in Israel, someone would jump and say, that's Israel bashing, that's anti-Semitism sometimes, and so on and so on. Today I even say there's worse than discrimination. There's institutional and intentional discrimination and I say that based on quoting Israel's Prime Minister in an official speech on July 10, 2007. Ehud Olmert, reading from an official text, he said the following statement. He said, we, the State of Israel, have been institutionally and intentionally discriminating against our Arab citizens. He continued, and this has to stop because this is in Israel's national interest. Now I took some classes in psychology and in, the, in one of the first classes they teach you that if you want to treat a patient, the first thing you need to do, to do with him is to get him out of the denial stage. Because the patient, someone with a psychological problem, usually deny that they are even sick. It's the rest of the world who's sick, not me. Everyone else is, has a problem, not myself. And, but that was exactly the case that, for the first time, Israel said, went out of denial of exercising institutional discrimination against Arab citizens. Now in psychology, in psychology they tell you, getting a patient out of denial, it's 50% of the treatment. The next stage is to have that patient take responsibility over the treatment. But that was the second part of the statement of the Prime Minister. He said, this has to stop, and he justified it not by saying because it's right, or because it's nice, or because it's moral, or because it's the democratic nature of Israel, or because it's security, or whatever. He said, because it's in Israel's national interest. That was the first time that the term national interest in Israel was not just the Jewish national interest, it was that it, in, it became the Israeli national interest which was inclusive of the non-Jewish population in Israel, the 20% Arab population. 
It was a maturity stage, maturity statement, that has given birth to a new discourse, a new discussion. So I told you that until the year 2000, we were operating with the mindset of coexistence education. After the year 2000, when we realized that coexistence doesn't solve the problem, we went into the dialogue, which was mostly based on historic narrative. It's not, just, it's not enough to eat hummus in the same table, but let's, let's talk about the problems. So we have a wonderful table here. You get obvious people with religious Jewish background and obvious people with Muslim religious background. And the question is, beyond the food, beyond the meal here, let's talk about the problems. So the, the problems would start, for example, who did what today? Who stabbed whom? Who shot whom? Who killed whom? Who's responsible for the in incidents of the last 24 hours? And you start backtracking to last week, who started this intifada last month? Was it justified or not justified? Who's the victim uh, in this story? And it goes usually back to Abraham. Who did he want to sacrifice? <laughs> we go as far as 3,000 years ago, or 5,000 years ago. Was it the Canaanites, or was it the, Palest uh, the Philistines? Wh whose land is this? That's the narrative dialogue. And for some time, there was a feeling that this is essential to let go, to put things on the table, so it's not just about niceties, it's also hard talk about the hardcore issues. The problem with this, if it's done alone, it polarizes. And we've learned that that's not the way to run encounters between Jews and Arabs. If you do it within the format of the contact theory, where you also provide the personal human contact it sort of reduces the tension because that allows more tolerance of different perspectives. But what we realized, you know, the third generation kind of work that we are working on based on, based on right now is another theory in conflict resolution which is called the superordinate goal theory. Which basically says what are our mutual interests? Where do we meet on issues and where do we separate in issues? So we still disagree on the narrative of the last month, or we still disagree on how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict might have to end. Should it be one state, two states, ten states, fifteen states? I don't know. I seriously don't know what's going to be the solution there. If anyone knows here, let me know. I'm ready to buy it from you. <laughs> uh, I think we're mostly at loss right now of how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is going to be resolved, uh, uh, although most, the massive majority of Palestinians and the massive majority of Israelis would subscribe to still to two-state solution. I subscribe to that. I don't know how realistic that is. Let's wait and see. But unfortunately, by waiting and seeing, we continue to pay the price of not accomplishing it. It's not just wait and see in a nice comfort zone. It's wait and see in a very harsh comfort zone where people pay their lives during this process. So now we're focusing, back to our issue, we're focusing on the uh, superordinate goal theory, which brings people to discuss what's in it for me. I'm not here just to meet you in order to be nice to the Jews or to be nice to the Arabs, but in order to gain interest out of it. So if you, bring, if you create a business forum for Jewish and Arab business people, suddenly you realize that that forum can be sustained for long time and it can produce benefit and financial benefit for both sides. If you produce uh, uh, between the two towns, two neighboring towns, and that's one of the projects we do, if you produce a program that brings the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations to come and collaborate on certain projects, so instead of sending a bus to the museum in Jerusalem with the 20, one bus for 20 Jewish family, uh, uh, travelers and another bus for 20 Arab uh, uh, travelers, you send one bus with 40 people, it's 50% the cost for them. It's half cost, it's half the price. And, but those are the principles of cooperation on mutual interests. And that has become the new foundation for our work. So now we try to take this and translate it onto more structural programs. So one layer, one silo of activities is the adult population. Uh, and in that we, we pair Jewish and Arab towns 
to cooperate on zoning plans and land issues which are very, very tough issues, very harsh issues of who has jurisdiction over X territory, who has, who's allowed to make development plans for certain territory. These are tough issues because they have political ingredients into them as well. On environment, you know, where, where should an Arab village have its sewage treatment uh, uh, pool? Usually as far as possible from the Arab village, as close as possible to the Jewish village. And the opposite, where no one takes into concern the, or, uh, uh, the interests of the other in this process. Maybe they can have the same sewage treatment system. And that can solve the problem, one makes it cheaper, second more environmentally sound, and health sound. They both benefit out of it. So we take this process, these ideas, and we try to bring them to, education, to the educational silo. And in education we have also uh, three levels of activity. One is contact. Every Jewish and every Arab child deserves the chance to meet the other. Deserves the chance to touch, to feel, to play, to realize that the other side does not have a horn, they do not have a tail, they eat from the same plate and they don't throw poison in it, they stay in the same dorm and they don't stab you. You develop, a human, it's, it's a humanization aspect. Conflict dehumanizes the other, not just Jewish and Arab. We start giving non-human image to the other to make it easier for us to justify why we hate them or why we are afraid of them. You know, everyone is afraid of a monster, but if it's a nice looking good person that you spent three days with them and they were really fantastic people, it's harder to hate a person that you develop kinship towards or, or shared experience with. The, so today one of our main programs is called Face to Face and it brings kids to do that. Soccer camp, uh, art workshops uh, and activities of that nature. The harder layer of the program is for high school kids. That's where we allow the, the, the narrative dialogue discussion as well to develop. And it's mostly for more elite group, youth, youth leaders, kids that have the capacity to also engage in those kind of discussions. But again, few, many people like to do that, but it's dangerous work as I said. Is that if you do not know how to wrap it back and unfolding it could be very, very polarizing. And the added value of it is that it's not a one time encounter that takes place for two, three days. It lasts for at least a year and the program is not to last for three years. So it could be the same teacher that revisits those kids for three years and not just one time. Only one time there were two evaluations done about the killing numbers. One by uh, Professor Garrison from Hanford University and one by uh, Dr. Van Hoss from uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And this, I guess, is wonderful. But the next event, which could be possible enough, or starting that they, should, they see or experience with a relative uh, connection to it, so that someone they know, that washes away all the good experience that they get from the one time encounter. A sustainable encounter produces more solid results because it's a way the kids will feel that it's, it's the norm. It becomes the norm for them to have an Arab in their environment or a Jewish person in their environment. It's not abnormal when you're kidnapped by a Jewish for a few days, you're brainwashed and then you're sent back to the It's still important, but it has to be sustained it's not just about good relations. You know, when we talk in, in, in our uh, industry, Jewish art relations, so I use that term, uh, there's a debate. Most Jewish oriented organizations and most of the Jewish colleagues in this field and the non colleagues also would say coexistence first. And most Arabs and Arab oriented organizations would say equality first. And we think of them as two ends of circle. Most Jews would say, let's coexist 
have good relations, and this would lead towards equality. You want equality? Fine. You get equality. But only if you prove goodwill, only if you behave, only if you're nice, and we will reward you with equality. Most Arabs say the exact opposite. They say equality first, prove to us, the Jewish majority in Israel, prove to us that your intentions of democracy are real by action, by equalizing budgets, we are equalizing opportunities and so on and so on. And we will reward you, the Jews in Israel, with the prize which is for existence. So in the spectrum that often do not meet. As a result, we increase the polarization and we increase the, the differences instead of actually collaborating. So organizations working for equality do not see themselves as the same organizations working for coexistence. Now the, the, new, the new theory that we've developed over the past seven, eight years at Kibbutz Liba is that the concept should be not equality and not coexistence. We need to talk about shared society. That's the issue, by the way, on your table. Shared society. A shared society assumes that at the same time you're working for coexistence, you need to be working for equality. If you are not doing that, you're short. You're professionally short. You're not going to accomplish your results. If the only way you do is working for equality and not concerned about good relations between the communities, again, you're not going to go to the top function. You might grow as two equal, separate, polarized, antagonistic communities. That is not resolve issues and does not contribute issues. So some of the programs that we've been developing have been also focusing on equality. I will share with you maybe one or two that every one of them I will mention a couple. Uh, one of them is called Balai Hai High Tech Seeds. This was not creativity. It was boring successful model. The successful model was looking at this as high tech and analyzing what are the successes and what are the experiences? The success is that 60,000 people in Israel, 65,000 people in Israel, generate 40% of the GDP of the economy in Israel. Small group of people drive 40% of the economy. They generate tremendous income, tremendous economic growth. But while our citizens are 20%, where only 2% of the employees in high by the way, high tech employee makes about three times the average wage in Israel. So that's the question why? Why aren't our citizens part of the high tech industry, the driving engine of the Israeli economy? We found the number of people, but the main one was where are these Jewish high tech employees breeded? And they're breeded in an interesting place, just for a minute. Inside the building, that's what they did. And not only, the, not only there, but in the last six, seven years, the military has been running programs in high schools, already in ninth grade, to increase the uh, involvement of kids with high tech potential so that they study in high school until the ninth grade. They study, they take academic courses in high tech. By the time they're 19, they have their degree in computer science. In the military with that degree, they play with the biggest stories you can think of, and they become the wizards of high tech industry afterwards. I tried to take this program to the opportunity without a military service. And then everyone said two problems. One, it can't be funded, because for the Jewish kids, it's the military that funds the high school kids, because they want them as high as the kids. And the second they say, the Arab mentality is not minded towards high tech. And that is not minded towards high tech. Anyhow, we, you know, I'm, I'm a bit stubborn. Uh, so I ended up finding a way to call it or have the other way, which is in our campus of Kiva Kaiva. And last Friday, in the third of October, we had the first group of 31 Arab kids that started the study. Even though we don't have a full budget. But we started with 31 kids, 9 graders studying computer science, because that's the way we want to challenge the industry. 
Finally, the next challenge is working successfully in other areas. Look at medicine, for example. Ten years ago, our percentage of the doctors in Israel was 10%. Today, it's 14%. Our percentage in the uh, Thank you. 